I do not like Disney. Thank you. Thank you. I know. It took a lot of personal reflection on my end to come out with a statement. I understand it could very well be the last I ever make, but I, I had to do it. And I know I'm not the only one that thinks that either. Plenty of kindred spirits like myself hate the animation studio turned mass media conglomerate way more than I ever could. And as history has gone to show, that doesn't always stop at people working outside the company. Hell, half of Disney's biggest competitors over the years popped up from within the studio. DreamWorks got started after Jeffrey Katzenberg stepped down as chairman of their animation department with an axe to grind and zero fucks to give. Pixar had a similar beginning. And of course, I couldn't talk about Disney competitors that originally worked for the studio without mentioning the legend himself, Don Bluth. Originally hired by Disney at 18 as an assistant on Sleeping Beauty, he'd go on to do animations for Robin Hood, Rescuers, Pete's Dragon, and Fox and the Hound, garnering a great reputation for his skill and creativity. But unfortunately, Disney wasn't in the market for the latter. After all, the studio was in a dark age when Bluth came in to work for him, and so that meant cutting costs whenever possible and sticking to formulas, which made for less inspired films. Not to mention they had little to no competition at the time, so what's the point in innovating if what they're doing works fine enough? But Bluth didn't see it that way. He thought that instead, plain and simple, Disney had lost their magic and weren't crafting films the way they used to. So after making a short with a couple Disney alumni over the course of four years, he and a handful of animators decided to quit so they could form their own studio with full creative freedom. And that would go on to be called Don Bluth Productions, later known as Sullivan Bluth Productions, later known as Bankrupt, oh no. later known as oh Defunct no. in 1995. But simplifying the studio and Bluth's history down to that makes it sound as though there was never any success. When to the contrary, they had several massive films. It just so happens that after those films, they had a series of bombs, and by the point it sank, Bluv moved on to another studio where they had another big hit, followed by another big bomb that also sunk that studio. The point of me telling you all this is to show that Bluv has had a storied history in animation and a career full of ups and downs, successes and complete failures, critical darlings and razzy recipients. So I'd say he's the ideal subject for what I'm about to do. This is every Don Bluv directed film ranked and reviewed, short films included, which means before I can move on to his independent work, we need to have a little aside for small one, small one, don't look so blue. As Bluv's singular directing credit for Disney before leaving to form DBP, the small one is a TV short film created as a way of training new talent that had recently been recruited for the studio. Seeing as the previous generation of Disney animators were all old or dead by that point, the need for a fresh lineup was staggering, and so after a process of recruitment, the small one was a sort of preamble to the team working on feature films, showing what they could do beforehand. And for a directorial debut, it's quite impressive. In fact, watching this helped me better understand Bluv's point about the decay of Disney's animated film department, since it has a completely completely different feeling to anything else produced at the time. The basic premise of the short is that an unnamed boy in biblical times has an old donkey he cares for called Small One, but it's gotten too old to work, so the boy's father wants him to sell Small One in the market, leading to hijinks as he tries to find the right buyer. What got me about the tone of the short was just how down-to-earth the characters felt, despite how minimally we saw them. In the few minutes they had on screen over the course of it all, you get a perfect summation of the boy and Small One's relationship that a lot of full-length films can't manage to do for me. It's that sweet kind of bond tons of animal lovers with old pets can relate to to, and Blue's distinctively expressive character animation really helps to sell it. He's a king at small details and exaggerations in all the right places to portray the most complex emotions in a few drawings. So Small One and the boy really fit that archetype of naive but aware of their surroundings, which I love. There are also a good number of complete assholes in the film, but they aren't over the top like the ones you'd expect from most Disney films at the time. They're all mean and cruel in a way that's not so exaggerated you couldn't see it happening in real life, but despicable enough to hate them. It's a delicate balance that they manage to keep consistent, including during the musical numbers. Oh yeah, the small one's technically a musical. It's barely 24 minutes, so there isn't exactly a lot of time to put songs in, but the ones they do have keep the personalities big and even out the harshness with an equal share of heart. The melodies are super basic, sure, but that works to the film's advantage, keeping up with its timeless aesthetic. The whole vibe of the short in general really radiates that energy of a movie you never quite know when or where it came from, but you also can't remember a time it wasn't always there, like Rudolph or Frosty. Did I mention Small One was a Christmas special? Cause it is, if you somehow didn't pick up on that already. It's very clearly set in the time of the Bible, and surprise, surprise, the buyer ends up being Joseph so he can help Mary get to the stable. Again, super basic twist, but in that charming sort of, oh, I knew that was gonna happen because I watched this with my family by the fireplace every year kind of way. Not to say I've watched this up till now, nor have I ever seen it air on TV, but it gives off those kind of indications, you feel? Don't lie to me. I'll kill you. Wait, what? So yeah, the small one, good effort from Bluv, has some of the marks of his signature style, gives early insight into what he was looking to do with his storytelling, impressive animation for a direct-to-TV film from the late 70s, all around an easygoing, fun little watch of the holidays. Banjo's the cat who could not behave, he seldom did what he should.
Remember that short I mentioned Bloove and a small team of animators did together on the site of their real jobs for four years before dropping out to form their own studio? Well, this... isn't it? Okay, it is, but I didn't want you to assume you knew what I was gonna say, cause, um... Fuck you. The story goes that Banjo, a rebellious little shit of a kitten, hates getting in trouble all the time on his farm and thinks his family doesn't care about him. So he decides to run away and bring his mischief to Salt Lake City where he can cause more collateral damage at a faster rate. Whoa, whoa, Banjo, watch out, watch out! Oh god, the humanity! But while Banjo's bloodlust might be infinite, his stamina isn't. And soon he realizes he made a big mistake, getting some help from a couple of city cats to find the car he hitched a ride on and go back home. Considering it's Bloove's only other short, I feel the need to compare it to Small One, and when it comes to story, it's way less organized. Everything after Banjo gets to the city is a montage of him doing shit, whether it's by himself or with the cats. And while I guess the story moves along over time, it's more like they force it to keep chugging along since they can't find a way for it to proceed naturally. For instance, after Banjo meets Crazy Legs, a street cat voiced by Scatman Crothers, Crazy tells Banjo, Oh, I know how to help you, kid. Let's go see my trio of singing cat dancer friends. They'll know how to help us. But then all they tell Banjo is, Be careful, there's danger. And family's pretty important, isn't it? And we're starving. That's the end of the sentence, followed by the main song of the movie about sticking together, but then the fucking singing cat trio is gone! The film goes back to Crazy and Banjo looking around without any indication of where they should go. What about the song they just sang about sticking together? It was mainly Crazy and Banjo singing to one another, I'll give you that, but the trio participated too, and if that wasn't spontaneously confusing enough, they do show up later after Banjo and Crazy get chased by dogs, and wish Banjo goodbye after the animators realize they need to end the short, and the car he's been looking for magically appears, but, uh, weren't the trio supposed to know something that would help Banjo? Banjo and Crazy find it, they didn't contribute shit. The car shows up on its own on account of Crazy praying for it to happen the night before, I guess, but you know what? With that kind of explanation, I kind of preferred it if they didn't provide a reason at all. It doesn't feel earned. More like the crew ran out of time focusing on miscellaneous scenes of the duo getting into shenanigans around Salt Lake and forgot they had to make sure there was a conclusion. And speaking of time, though the family is shown briefly at the start of the short and we're told how much Banjo cares for them, we never quite get enough time to see how much the family cares for Banjo. All they do is push him after he misbehaves and laugh at his misfortune. There's never a point where one of them's apologetic or whatever and pulls Banjo aside to say they only punish him in the hopes he doesn't get hurt in the long run. No sections in between him miserable in the city where the family's saying, damn, I sure do miss Banjo, I hope he's okay, I wonder where he is. Even in the conclusion, when Banjo makes it back home, the film ends right at that moment. The parents and siblings barely have enough time to communicate, cool, Banjo's back, I guess, before the credits roll. The end. I'm sorry, did I miss a scene? Or several? For all that build-up of Banjo saying he misses his parents, you're not even gonna show us the family's full reaction to him coming back? What? It all reminds me heavily of The Thief and the Cobbler, if that makes sense. Both were independently funded projects that put a bigger focus on the music and animation than the plot, so they kind of fizzled out at the end with a deus ex machina finish when they couldn't come up with a proper end built up over the course of the story. The difference between Banjo and Thief being that Thief was a full-length film and Banjo's a short, meaning it has less time to try and make sense of its nonsensical story in between the spectacle, so there's all the less to chew on, meaning by the end you're left more than a little confused. Basically, Banjo tries to build up its atmosphere before its story, but by the time that ambience is set, there's there's almost no time or money left to make sure the story is cohesive, so they've got to use what they already have of the story and make a plot from what's there, but it's missing some obvious pieces so it doesn't quite work. On the positive side, I can respect that ambience the crew focused on so heavily for how great of a job they did at capturing the full essence of the big city, but it's hard for me to appreciate considering how disconnected all the moments that take place in it are. And that sucks, cause the setting, in part thanks to the animation, that I can't emphasize enough is incredibly impressive for the film's near non-existent budget, reached a pleasant mix between the bright lights and colors of downtown and the darker, seedier side to match. They've got a ton of personality, and the songs like Stick With Me are also well-performed and charming, as they should be with the cast of jazz singers Bloof and crew got to voice a majority of the characters. There's so much style, but it's missing substance. If I were to turn my brain off and look at it purely from a technical standpoint, I couldn't come up with one negative thing to say. But as a story, meant to have a definite beginning, middle, and end, with characters to invest myself in, it leaves much to be desired. So it's gonna go below small one in the ranking for how much of a mess its plot is, but I do still appreciate the effort and recognize the milestone Banjo was for Bloove as an artist. If anything, the main reason for it being this way probably came down to Bloove having too little restraint. He was still working at Disney during the short's production, so getting to let loose on a project he didn't have constant super supervision over, uh, of course it'd be super chaotic. I just hope that as his career progresses, he finds a way to rein that creativity in and refine it in the same way he did for Small One. Oh, and by the way, can I also briefly mention the shitty box art for the film's DVD release I bought? Like, what did they do to Banjo and Crazy? That doesn't match how they look in the short at all. And more importantly than that, why did I see this same trend with so many direct-to-video Disney sequels too? Who keeps hiring this damn artist? <laughs> 
All right, now we're finally getting to the movie stage of Blue's career, starting with what else but his and DVP's first full-length feature film, The Secret of Nim. Based off of a book titled Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, the adaptation was originally pitched to none other than Disney, who rejected the idea for having a dark tone, therefore believing it couldn't make a profit. Ironic, considering Disney went on to make a much darker film with Black Cauldron. But since they didn't want it, Blue convinced a small studio to cede him the rights to the book and an absolutely minuscule budget to get the film into production, and I mean, it was tiny. Secret of Nim was made made on a budget of around $6.5 million, and 700,000 of that came from Blue, his associates, and the executive producers mortgaging their homes since there was no other way to raise the money. They had to go all or nothing hoping the film would succeed, and yet it nevertheless only cost around half that of Disney's nearest film, Fox and the Hound, and had half the time to be completed. The crew was really racing against the clock to get it finished on time, and often that led to strenuous work weeks and overtime with no pay, but in the end, they did finish by the deadline, and though comparatively to Disney, it played in way fewer theaters, Nim was still a moderate hit and propelled Blue's studio forward into making more. So how does the film hold up in retrospect? I'll tell you this much, it's more worth remembering than most of Disney's Dark Age. The film stars Mrs. Brisby, they had to change her name for copyright reasons, a widowed mouse of four children who needs to move her family before they get killed by a farmer's plow. She can't get away though because one of her children, Timmy, is sick with pneumonia and can't get out of bed. So she has to go on an adventure looking for help from the Rats of Nim, who her husband Jonathan was associated with, meeting several interesting characters along the way. And for sure, that's gotta be the film's strongest attribute. First thing I need to mention about the cast is just how perfect of a protagonist Mrs. Brisby is. There have been plenty of half-hearted attempts at making characters brave by having them charge into danger haphazardly, disregarding the consequences, but that's not what bravery is. That's stupidity, if not blind optimism. Bravery is going up against something, no matter how dangerous or terrifying it is, for the reason that you know you have to. And Mrs. Brisby exemplifies that amazingly. She's scared of basically everything that comes her way, and though she has enough common sense to know how to stay alive, she's willing to go against her better judgment if it means helping her family. The very the fact the story occurs at all is enough to tell you plenty about her character without saying a word, and so her being chosen to get an amulet that endows strength to the courageous makes sense. She's a super enduring protagonist from beginning to end, and that makes the story's villain stick out just as much. Technically speaking, the film has a couple antagonists. Nim, or the National Institute of Mental Health, is an underlying threat, being the ones that gave the rats intelligence and tried to exterminate them. Dragon the Cat is another minor antagonist that's more an obstacle of the cast rather than a character unto himself, but who I'm referring to is Jenner, a rat of Nim that does doesn't approve of the current leadership and isn't keen on change. You see, a major theme of the rats as a mischief, cause that's what you call a group of rats, is that they're trying to become self-sufficient and stop stealing electricity from the humans to power their society, having a strong urge to rise above their basic instincts to show they're able to do the same as them. And part of that means leaving the rosebush they live in to look for a place called Thorn Valley. However, Jenner doesn't want to leave the rosebush and tries to turn the other rats against Nicodemus, the current leader, by killing him and using the moment to assert himself, advocating that they should stay in the rosebush and keep mooching off the humans. Everything about Jenner as a character is based on fear, complacency, underhandedness, and self-adulation. All that Mrs. Brisby isn't. He's a superb foil, albeit slightly simplistic, but by this point, if there's one thing I've learned about Blue and his style, it's that he can take a seemingly simple concept and make it work the best way possible, and that's how I view Jenner in the grand scheme of the narrative. Simple, but memorable, and effective. That's pretty much how I feel about most of the cast, too. Plenty of them are archetypes, there's no denying that, but they're used and developed to the best extent possible. Other than the clumsy crow Jeremy, that is, he's not the worst or anything anything, but he doesn't contribute much to the plot, and serves the same kind of role as the duo of Birds and Fox and the Hound, he's there to add comic relief and break up the flow of the film without adding much at all, so his scenes feel like a waste. It's possible I could come to appreciate him on rewatch of the film, but regardless, it's not a deal breaker. One two and a hand of aces isn't gonna stop it from being a straight flush. It, is that how poker works? I came up with that on the fly, I barely ever play it. In simpler terms, it's not worth getting caught up on the little flaws when there's so much to enjoy, and that goes double for the film's visuals. I adore how Secret of Nim looks, especially after knowing about its harrowing production. Don's crew having the skill to make such wonderfully fluid traditional animation on as much of a time crunch as they had should speak for itself, but I'm gonna do it for him anyway. The whole film from start to finish implements so many different kinds of unique practices to get the effects they're going for, and often you won't notice unless you pay attention. There are moments of rotoscoping, alternative color palettes to simulate lighting, and certain effects for flashes and glows are done using an old technique known as backlit animation that shines light through color cell drawings to produce it. I could keep going on, and there are other experimental visual effects used, but you get the gist. And in regards to the traditional animation, it's just as impressive. I know I mentioned it briefly when talking about the small one before, but Blue and his crew have a knack for conveying emotion through facial expressions, and Secret of Nem, as their first full-length film, allows way more time to show off that feature than ever before. One of my personal favorite moments of them using facial emotion effectively is after Mrs. Brisby's home, with all of her four children in it, sinks into the mud. She believes there's no way to help them and that her family, the group she's been bravely fighting for the entire movie, the ones that keep 
keep the memory of her dead husband alive have sunken into the ground and can't come back. A less talented writer would have her break down in tears, screaming out in agony, but mixed in with her exhaustion and pure despair, Mrs. Frisbee doesn't say anything, yet you can visibly see her heart break in real time. It's stunning how much they're able to convey in complete silence. But that's exactly what Bluth wanted to do, to use the skills and techniques he learned to make a film reminiscent of what Disney animations used to be before they got into cost cutting. And I'd say he succeeded with Flying Colors. Excellent film all around. Top of the ranking, unquestionably. Ha! <laughs> you, you get it? They, uh, they used tail in the name, but it's not T-A-L-E tail, no, it's spelled the same way as, <clears throat> um, a, a mouse's tail. So anyway, serving as the start of a few collaborations with Steven Spielberg, An American Tale was Blue's first real foray into the mainstream as an independent filmmaker, and thanks to the project having a marketing budget this time around, it was a much bigger success than Nim, and therefore way more easily recognizable. But was it better? Possibly. I'll give the film this. It's Blue's most explicitly political film, offering the one time in his catalog going into social commentary, and that's by far its strongest element. American Tale is about a Jewish family of mice living in Russia who are hunted by cats and choose to immigrate to America, where they believe they'll be free of them for good, but on the boat ride over, our main character Fievel ends up falling overboard and has to traverse New York City in search of his family without a clue in the world where to go. And already from that basic description, you can glean a couple glaringly obvious metaphors. The cats represent Russians and other groups oppressing minorities, while the mice are refugees that have heard fairy tales about the wondrous new world of America and believe they're destined to have a great life with no problems over there. Hell, one of the musical numbers is straight up called There Are No Cats in America to help drive home the point that a majority of their optimism for going to the USA is founded on fairy tales and myths, much like the idea of the American dream appeal to migrants, and using cats for this kind of allegory is great, cause of course we know that there are cats all over the world. So a viewer could easily connect the dots that the film is saying discrimination and prejudice is all around, and thinking there's a place where it all comes to an end doesn't exist. However, the immigrants can overcome that discrimination by banding together as a community of varying statuses and help each other through adversity, as shown in the climax of the film when the rich and poor mice alike band together to trick the cats using the combined efforts of their camaraderie. Don't get any funny ideas though, the film doesn't glamorize the process of immigration at all. In fact, for a mid-80s kids film, it's kinda impressive how realistic the staff was about the experience plenty of foreigners had to go through, portraying the slow fall of blind optimism amongst the migrants as they realized it wasn't quite the dreamland they expected it to be, how tons of immigrants Immigrants were exploited for being newcomers to the country by putting them in jobs that basically equated to slave labor, families adapting to the fact they have to get name changes for the sake of fitting in, and the genuine hope that comes in knowing they're still in a better place than they once were and could possibly make it work. It's all there and conveyed just as naturally as the allegory between cats and mice without taking away from the main story but instead adding on to it, helping distinguish it from Banjo the Woodpile Cat, which this film is definitely meant to partially be an improved version of. You've got the kid lost in a huge old timey city that meets a big cast of characters in search of his family. The reason he got separated from them in the first place was due to his own selfishness and naivety. And a third thing that'll come up when I'm reading this off in the script. Fucking past Braxton, that fucker. But yeah, American Tale for sure takes inspiration from Banjo and uses its feature length runtime to fix all the problems I addressed. Fievel has multiple heartwarming interactions with his family that establish their love. Amidst Fievel looking for his parents, there are loud scenes devoted to mourning and hoping Fievel's alright. Then finding each other at the end of the film makes complete sense with all the build up beforehand, and that emotional payoff lasts for longer than five seconds. It basically fixes all all of Banjo's problems, and as I thought, that makes it a more emotionally gripping film. Though there is one thing less appealing in American Tale than Banjo, and that's the music. By God, Fievel is a likable main protag, but his voice actor cannot sing for shit. And you know, at first it's charming, but when you grant him three musical numbers to do it, the novelty kind of wears off and becomes annoying. Like, I understand he's a kid, but come on, you couldn't have pulled a Lion King and got someone different for the songs, or at least got the kid a vocal coach so he isn't constantly singing out of his range. Beneath the I can appreciate a raw performance or an imperfect child's interpretation. After all, Manny is one of my favorite musical films, but this is too much. The imperfection has become so evident it's grating. And I love the songs on a melodic, lyrical, and symbolic level, especially somewhere out there. That's a great number that's brought out more in the rendition performed by actual singers. It's no wonder that version got to number two on the Billboard Hot 100. But the film version is so much harder to listen to. I can tolerate it, and the raw emotions it's stuffed with do hit hard, but a better performer would have undoubtedly added so much. Regardless though, it thankfully doesn't take away from the emotional core of the film, and overall I still consider it a great experience. It's hard trying to compare American Tale to Nim since they're such different films on so many levels, but while it may be a controversial opinion, I'll put it above for having more prominently complex themes, slightly better pacing, and an improved, memorable set of side characters. Definitely worth a watch.
Bet you didn't know this franchise started out as a theatrical Don Blue film. I'm not so sure if this is still a big part of people's childhoods anymore since most of them came out on VHS, but I know for a fact that if you were born before 2007, you've seen one of, if not several, of the Baker's Dozen Land Before Time sequels. And that's not a comedic number I made up to joke about the scope. There are seriously 13 direct-to-video sequels to the Land Before Time, plus a TV show. And personally speaking, I never quite understood why. From what I can remember, they were decent entertainment, nothing too exceptional. But was the concept really that great of an idea that it warranted more films than Star Trek? Were people so drawn to dinosaurs going on adventures that they had to keep pumping out film after film for over a decade? I get it was Blue's most successful, well-remembered film, but I Volt, it got a bit excessive after a while, don't you think? With all the money and talent from those 13 mediocre movies, you could have made... Like, one and a half good movies. Then again, Scooby-Doo's got, like, twice as many films under its belt, so maybe it's not so bad in comparison. Though I do gotta ask, what kind of foundation could make for a good enough basis that so much additional media could build on top of it after the fact? Well, I should make it clear for anyone that's seen the sequels but not the original film that, if it wasn't obvious already, the theatrical release for The Land Before Time is way different than anything those sequels had to offer. It's not a musical, there are only five main characters in the cast, and somehow it's shorter than every direct-to-video film that came out after it. Yeah, weird I know, but something that immediately struck me about Land Before Time from the moment I started watching was how incredibly short it is for a theatrically released film, clucking in at a clean 64 minutes without credits. Apparently, from what I can find, three or four extended scenes were removed from the film for being thought of as too violent or unnecessary, but even then, there's only so much that they could have cut out. So I guess the film was intended to be shorter than average, and I bring it up not to criticize the film, but as a positive. So many movies, no matter the subject, feel the need to go for an arbitrary 90 minutes or longer run time to, I suppose, ensure viewers don't get the impression they were given less than a film, but with Land Before Time scope, story, and theme-wise, barely over an hour is an ideal length to convey all they need to without dragging it out. According to Bluv, during production, a major inspiration for the film was Bambi, and I can feel that in his presentation. Various parts of Bambi were heavily focused on capturing the beauty of wilderness, and specifically in the opening to Land Before Time, you feel that same brand of nature documentary aesthetic as a narrator describes what life was like for herbivores in the prehistoric age, at the same time establishing the main cast and their personalities by showing the ways they come out after hatching, and that vibe carries on across the runtime, continuing with intermittent narration when most appropriate, and taking every opportunity to show the beautiful but equally cruel sides of nature. But there's way more to the film than that. As while the story is intentionally rudimentary, its characters are complex. The basic idea of the story is that Littlefoot, one of the last of his kind, is separated from his grandparents and loses his mother after a tectonic plate shift. So he has to find his way to the Great Valley, a land of trees and greenery his family was already headed to without their help gathering a group of other lost kids along the way while trying to avoid a T-Rex they call a sharp tooth, and more so than that, try to avoid a big fight amongst themselves. A quirky pattern I've noticed while binging through Blue's films is that he likes to incorporate one or two ideas from his previous works into the next, adding a kind of narrative flow to each of his subsequent ventures for those that keep up with his filmography. And so for Land Before Time, he and the writers borrow American Tales' theme of discrimination and transform it from focusing specifically on exploitation and persecution over to segregation, the passing of hateful ideas, and how anger as well as confusion grows with each subsequent generation. As it's explained by adults, the various breeds of dinosaur we see across the film aren't allowed to mingle with one another, or interact at all really, because of how different each of them is. And that's how it's always been, so throughout the film, beyond the ever-going animosity between our main protagonists, we get glimpses into this sort of every species for themselves mentality that this mindset created, such as when the group finds a stray bundle of trees, but can't get to it before another herd charges past them and eats it. The crew hardly questions why it is the herd doesn't leave much of anything to share, since it's contextually already been explained. And I love that type of mixed visual figurative storytelling that can add depth to what's already primarily focused on in the film, but if you don't notice it, it doesn't take away from the main idea personified in the relationship between Littlefoot and Sarah. After all, the establishment of segregation between dinosaurs is originally defined during the duo's first interaction, trying to play together but getting separated by their parents and told they can't. It's an easy indicator to set up what their main back and forth is going to be about across the film, but what goes on to make their rivalry unique is how each one of them interprets the separation. Littlefoot doesn't understand why he can't hang out with Sarah beyond the fact that his mom told him not to, and so after her death, when trying to say the same to another kid that wants to go along with him, he can't come up with a decent justification and lets go of a stigma before it can grow. On the other hand, Sarah immediately comes to the conclusion that the reason she couldn't play with Littlefoot is that she's better than him. So when she's left to fend for herself, instead of allowing Littlefoot and the others to help her after the earthquake, Sarah chooses to act proud and head off on her own, despite the fact she has no idea where to go and is grossly incompetent. 
sides, leading to her hatred growing rather than dying out. Their two sides of the same coin led down opposing paths thanks to their interpretations of being segregated. And what's great about telling a discrimination story through the eyes of kids is that they're only just now coming to have the most basic understanding of that concept, meaning they don't have good excuses for their racism beyond the blunt ideas of you're different and I'm better. The idea is fresh in their heads, so it's far more believable that they could change their mind over a short period of time. Plus, by introducing characters that have never had the chance to experience segregation, they offer a unique perspective that makes the indoctrinated kids question their own prejudice, something that Land Before Time does using characters like Petrie and Ducky, who are willing to join Littlefoot pretty much immediately and play a part in changing his mind. Whereas Sarah's stubbornness means she needs to slowly transition into accepting the group over time. Initially, I thought about mentioning Sarah being so unlikable for so long as a negative, but her acting that way is integral to the major themes of the film, and she gets her come up it's when she deserves it, so I'll let it slide. Still though, I'm going to rank it lowest of the three films so far, not due to a lack of quality by any means, but by virtue of the bar set by the two films before being so high. A classic all around, but right now, it's technically mid-tier. Let me be surprised. Now there's a title that grabs your attention from the moment you read it. All Dogs Go to Heaven. What the fuck kind of movie has a title like that? Honestly, I'm still looking for the answer myself, because out of all of Blue's films so far, it's the most confusing in terms of what it wants to do. At the start, it's about a convict named Charlie breaking out of the pound to go back to work at the casino he runs with another dog called Carface. Unbeknownst to him, however, Carface was the one that set up Charlie's false conviction in order to get him out of the picture and take all the profits. So now that he's back, Carface wants to make the end of their partnership more permanent by killing him off, and unlike most movie villain plots, he succeeds. Charlie's hit by a car, drowns, and goes to heaven since all dogs are naturally good and loyal and kind. Unfortunately for heaven though, Charlie isn't ready to go and after figuring out that things die when their life clock stops ticking, he steals his and makes it start running again so he can get revenge. You following along? Cause it's not going to get any less confusing from here. Once Charlie makes it back to Earth, he hears from his friend Itchy that Carface has a monster he's hiding, and the duo try to steal it to use in the plot of Charlie's revenge. One problem though, it's not a monster at all. It's a little girl that can talk to animals named Anne-Marie. And with that in mind, Charlie's whole plan changes to using the kid for profit while she looks for a family, forming a bond as they go and avoiding Carface after he finds out that Charlie's still alive. For all the other films I've talked about so far, I was able to describe the general gist of the premise and storyline in one, maybe two sentences. That description took me six, which should already tell you plenty about how Dogs operates over the course of its runtime. There are way too many concepts flying around, getting picked up and dropped off over the course of the film, and so for that reason, it never feels like its ideas are used to the fullest. Charlie loses his casino where everyone loves him, barely gets any focus. We're already on to him trying to get revenge on Carface, somehow not coming to the conclusion he could use the gambler's preference to his advantage. People can come back to life by winding up their time clocks and taking them with them, but if the clock stops again, they're dead for good? That's hardly gonna have any relevance until the final climax of the film. Yeah, it's around his neck the whole time, but outside of when he loses the watch in the sinking ship, he never questions if it's okay. And Carface. After Charlie takes away Anne-Marie, he basically completely forgets about Carface for like a third of the movie and builds a whole new casino with his name and everything plastered on the front of it. Aren't you supposed to be in hiding? What worked best about Blue's films and shorts was their simplicity, since it allowed the characters and setting to be fleshed out instead. So those were generally more the guy's strong suit than creating a full-on epic, so what happened here? Well, well, just take a look at the writers list for each of his films. Secret and M, four writers. An American Tale, three writers. Land Before Time, three writers. All Dogs Go to Heaven, ten writers. Ten. That's more than the last three films combined. And if that wasn't enough confusion to deal with, taking input from almost a dozen people on a single script, Bluv and his entire studio moved from California to Ireland with the help of a new partner during production. And speaking of that studio, Goldcrest, it was completely unassociated with Spielberg, who Bluv felt was too restrictive on his vision. So All Dogs Go to Heaven is another result of him having way less restraint than ever before. Reminder here, the last time that happened, we got Banjo the Woodpile Cat. So it should be evident by this point that Bluv works best under restrictions, and for dogs, that that was the one thing he didn't have. Sure, I can still follow the story along and understand how it develops over the course of the film, but then there are moments like when Charlie and Anne-Marie fall into a sewer and have a musical number with a singing alligator that's also got a tribe of mice? Like, what the fuck is happening? I know Nostalgia Critic coined it as a popular term for a scene with no relevance to the plot of the film that shows up out of nowhere and ends just as abruptly, but the alligator actually comes back at the end of the movie. He's the one that kills Carface by eating him and stops Charlie from dying. He's integral to the story now, and by the end of the film, we don't even know his name. Why is he there? 
What was his story? Why did the crew decide to hand him a big parody type Broadway show stopping number? I don't understand. And while we're on the topic of music, I gotta be blunt, it's not good. In previous musicals by Bloove, there was a mix of good and mediocre numbers all around, but I can't think of a single melody from All Dogs Go to Heaven. I remember what some of them were about, but if you put a gun to my head and asked me to hum the tunes or sing the lyrics, I couldn't give you an answer. They weren't terrible or anything, I wasn't annoyed, but out of all the films for Bloove to make a musical out of, so far, Dogs feels like the least necessary. It's not worse off for having them, but the movie would have been better if it didn't. Was the film really in need of a song solely dedicated to sharing, or Anne-Marie singing the most generic ballad about love you've ever heard, or the, the, the fucking crocodile number still not over that? All it does is muddy the waters of a decent film that had no need for them, and there are positives despite my complaining. Animation-wise, it might be Blue's best-looking film yet, and I enjoy that it's willing to get pretty dark for a kid's movie by killing its main character off at the start and having him stay dead by the end. Not too many people in children's media are willing to pull that kind of trigger, and it's amplified by Charlie and Anne-Marie authentically caring for one another. It's a semi-typical bad guy finds a good kid that changes him for the better story, but in the mid to late 80s, that was a relatively fresh concept, and their characterizations helped distinguish them from other pairings of the time. Charlie isn't just a bad guy through and through, he cares about kids and has a good reputation with people. Anne-Marie isn't a plain and simple dumb kid that's strung along for her talent without a clue in the world. She's perceptive and calls Charlie out when he's selfish or doesn't keep his promises. They're both more three-dimensional than most implementations of the trope. Also, look at Carface. He's a bulldog in a tuxedo top. That's peak character design. I want to put it at the top of the ranking for that alone. But I'm gonna go with my gut instead and put it below Land Before Time. Forgive me, tuxedo dog. I'm gonna rock a doodle doodle to you. Like you rock a doodle doodle. Buckle up, boys and girls. From this point on, we're entering what fans of Bloof like to call his film Dark Age, a time where, in part thanks to Disney having <laughs> a bit of a resurgence, he ended up with flop after flop, all for movies that supposedly deserve to do so. But is there any truth to that statement? Based on the first one alone, I'm not so sure. Inspired by a scrap Disney film from the 30s that never went into full production, Rockadoodle tells the tale of Chanticleer, a rooster that sings to make sure the sun rises every morning, except for one when he forgets to sing and the sun rises anyway, convincing the farm he works on and himself that he's a fraud. Once he leaves the country to try finding it in the big city though, it's revealed he, in reality, does make the sun rise, and without him there to sing, a group of birds that hate the sun, led by the Duke of Owls, brings rain to the farmland. So it's up to a real life kid turned into a kitten, Edmund, and the farm animals to find Chanticleer and bring him back. You might be wondering why it is the sun shined without him singing, if that is indeed what brings it up, but the film itself never provides a clear answer. There are plenty of meaningless platitudes and reassurances to Chanticleer that the farm animals were wrong and he's the only one that can bring the sun up, but they never explain why the sun still rose when he didn't sing. I guess we'll never know. Except, in this case, we can. According to Bloove himself in an interview months before the film released, he says the reason the sun comes up anyway is due to it having gotten so used to Chanticleer singing at the same time every day, it does it subconsciously without noticing. Then when the farm animals kick Chanticleer out and call him a phony, the sun gets angry and chooses not to rise again until Chanticleer comes back. Why was that idea never pointed out or explained in the actual film? My guess would be that it got lost in production after Bloove and co were pressured by Goldcrest to do repeat test screenings and take feedback notes to redo scenes and until they were sure it was a hit in the making. The executives were super adamant about getting a big success after All Dogs Go to Heaven only performed moderately well theatrically, though it should be noted they made an absolute killing on the home video market. And despite their best efforts, that's how Rocky Doodle fared as well, except they got it way worse theatrically. Ultimately, thanks to strong video sales, it made a slight profit, but as Bloove's most expensive venture yet, Rocky Doodle didn't even make its budget back in theaters. And out of all of Bloove's films that could have been his first to flop, I'm a little shocked it was this one. The film isn't great or anything, it's definitely a step down from All Dogs Go to Heaven, but it's not a massive step. Worst thing I can say about it besides the one big plot hole is that the main character Edmund has a sort of annoying lisp, the side cast is a little forgettable, and the villain, the Duke of Owls, has to be Bloove's weakest villain. He's given some life through a way too passionate voice performance from Christopher Plummer, and I understand he's supposed to be a play on those dastardly, obviously evil mustache twirler type characters from old Rubber Hose era cartoons, but that's about all he's got, so he's less of a satire and more like a genuine attempt, and in that regard, he's it's nothing too special. There's a fine line between maniacal, charming, over-the-top evil to the point you can't help but love the character, such as Scar from Lion King, and over-the-top evil, but not over-the-top with enough substance or personality, so they become a cliché and you laugh at them for completely unintentional reasons. Ooh, I, I wonder who the villain of the movie could be. Maybe it's the guy in the Dracula cape with a monocle in his eye that hates the sun and spoken word sings opera about it to a choir of owl sidekicks. And with what you suppose he turns on the Duke? What master? A flashlight! Unfortunately, they never sing a song over a minute long in the film, because they're all so comically bad and on the nose they become hilarious. 
You know what, actually, I take it back. I love this guy. It might be for ironic reasons, but he goes from unfunny failed attempt at a satire to a mediocre genuine attempt at a villain, all the way back around to becoming a stupid bad guy that's so stupid he's entertaining. In previous Blue films, when there were bad songs, I didn't want to listen to them, but the Dukes are just so incredibly stupid and simplistic in a fun way that I loop around to adoring them. They sing about the most obvious, minuscule shit that has no reason to be sung about considering it's already been stated as much or visually conveyed in the story, but their inclusion is so funny I don't mind. Like, come on, how can you hate a song that goes, twiddly D, they're running out, they're running out of batteries, ha ha ha, ha 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 ha, ha ha ha, ha ha, no batteries. And that's the whole thing, it lasts 19 seconds and that's all the time it needs. Same's true of that one super short bouncer song that exists for literally no reason other than the sake of it. The fact that it has no reason to exist only makes it better. Listen to some of these lyrics. Don't touch the star. Try, you won't get very far. We'll bounce, bounce all over the place. Bounce, 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 bounce if we don't like your face. I didn't quite capture the pure insanity as a lot of the ironic humor comes from how they deliver it, but regardless, this is fucking golden. Am I weird? Tell me I'm not the only one that laughs hysterically listening to this. Though truthfully, I wouldn't describe Rockadoodle's fully formed musical numbers in the same way, especially the ones primarily provided by Chanticleer, who's voiced by country singer Glenn Campbell. And though you probably have no idea who that is if you're under 60 years old, he's got a pretty nice voice. I decided to listen back to the soundtrack after the fact to hear the full version of a couple songs, and other than the Owls numbers which, as a reminder if you potentially forgot, are hilariously bad and worth listening to, I found myself humming along to more than one of them. I'm not a country fan, but Sundu Shine is absolutely boppable, and I love the little detail of how Chanticleer's songs change when he heads to the big city, going from banjos and yodeling to professional guitars and backup vocals. During my first watch of the movie, I had no idea they were originally created for the film. They do a great job at recreating the lyrical aesthetic of Elvis and 50s rock. I just wish I heard them more. So often and the song will be getting to the best part and then the dog narrator guy will come in and start giving needless exposition. And while I couldn't confirm the test screenings being a reason for why the explanation behind the sun coming up got taken out, I can for this. Apparently kids got bored of the longer numbers so they were shortened and that's dumb. Let the Elvis Rooster sing, you bastard children! <laughs> That's a line I never expected to say, but yeah, I wish there were less rewrites after test screening since it would have made for a more cohesive story that put greater focus on the surprisingly well done musical numbers, but hey, I had a good time regardless on both an ironic and serious level. It's got a good heap of flaws, particularly in the story and way too big sidecast, but for other bits like the owls, I'd hardly think of them as flaws when they're just so hilarious. And come on, how can you look at Edmund badly blue screened into the animated setting and not crack a smile? I know before I mentioned that as a film, it's a step down from All Dogs Go to Heaven, not having the same level of maturity or deeper thematic purpose, but for its entertainment value alone, what the hell, I'll put it above. I'd rather watch Rocky Doodle than Dogs. Could have been higher, but unfortunately, those test screenings also made it so the chicken Goldie was less sexy. And if this is the toned down version, I can only imagine how she looked before. Hopefully there are more films like this in Bloob's Dark Age, but I won't get too optimistic. So before I go into this particular film, let me paint you a little picture of where Bloof's headspace most likely was during its production. He hadn't had a major success since Land Before Time. Rockadoodle's failure led to Goldcrest backing out of financing a third feature for Bloof, and after filing the company for bankruptcy, he had to get backing elsewhere to finish what the studio was already working on. He needs this next film to be a hit, cause otherwise, the studio could be in jeopardy. So for once, he decides to try following the trends of the time and make a fairy tale princess musical based on a story by Hans Christian Andersen. The same story storyteller behind The Little Mermaid. There were a couple options he could have gone with for stories Disney hadn't adapted yet, such as The Princess and the Pea or The Snow Queen, which, funnily enough, went on to be the basis for Disney's most popular animated film ever, but he decided to go with Thumbelina. The story of a girl born out of a rose who longs to meet someone the same size as her until finding and subsequently falling in love with the Prince of the Fairies. However, before the prince can come back to see her again, she's kidnapped and tossed around by various woodland creatures that all want to marry her. Hijinks ensue as she tries to resist her white woman urges to hook up with animals. And if the somewhat copy-paste Disney art style or taking from a similar source isn't enough to convince you of his intentions, he also gets Ariel herself Jodie Benson to provide the voice of Thumbelina, and for added measure brings in the late Gilbert Gottfried, i.e. Iago from Aladdin, to voice a comic relief character that's constantly bossed around. Bloof's not exactly being subtle about his inspiration is all I'm trying to say, and that's so odd to see from him since up till now he's taken inspiration from other sources but he's never been this 
direct about it. Even musically speaking, there's tons of repetition. It all starts with a song about how dreams can come true from a narrator that's also a guide for the main character in the story like Jiminy Cricket. Thumbelina has an I Want song, a trope where characters, usually princesses, sing about what it is they crave in life that was establishing itself as a popular trope in Disney films at the time. After she meets the prince, they go on a magical sightseeing tour of the setting while singing a song about trust and how he can show her the universe a la a whole new world. It's all so obvious where its influence lies that as a test, the distributor Warner Bros. replaced their own logo with that of Disney's in the opening title, and it led to higher audience scores. And that, I think, is Thumbelina's biggest problem. Not that it borrows from so many Disney staples and tropes, but that it doesn't do anything unique with them. Thumbelina is a super derivative film that lacks a ton of Blue's trademarks, some kind of darker, adult aspect, deeper themes encompassing fear, prejudice, materialism, etc., interesting subversions or usage of common tropes, or at least a somewhat self-aware tone. The budget's higher, that's plain to see, but it's missing the roughness and amazing character expression Blue's known for in favor of cleaner lines and generic, realistic 50s Disney princess face. So it's a little hard to believe he directed this. And aside from lacking Blue's flavor, the film is free of almost any flavor at all. Moving aside from her size, what's Thumbelina like as a person? What distinguishes her from all the unique Disney princesses that get distinct personalities, wants, and desires? Looking at her I Want song, she hopes to find... Love. What kind of love exactly? Why, the true kind, of course. The kind that's hard to quantify or explain. The kind that has no descript features or indications of her having particular interests or qualities in a partner, but goddamn, she for sure wants it. It doesn't help us pin down her character, though. How about her I Am song with the farm animals that's explicitly meant to describe what her whole character's about? Well, from that, we can get that she's short. She wishes she knew other short people. And, nope, that's it. All she does is tell us the obvious. Maybe her personality shines in the romance she has with the fairy prince Cornelius. No, he never gets fully formed character traits either, so he's kind of a block of wood. And Thumbelina is the same, so I guess you could make a case for why they're meant for each other. But if you rub two blocks of wood together, you get a fire. And that's how my feelings went for whether or not they'd end up together crashing and burning. Part of why Whole New World worked so well was that we'd already been well acquainted with Aladdin and Jasmine beforehand. We saw how they lived normally, their struggles and seemingly impossible aspirations, and Whole New World is an encounter encapsulation of them finding that which we've come to know they both desire in different ways. That's why it happens over midway through the film, as opposed to Thumbelina, where she and Cornelia sing about seeing the universe together five minutes after meeting. Pretty much the whole rest of the movie is about the two looking for each other because they know for a fact they want to get married, but why? They know each other about as well as we know them, and that's nothing! Why well, care about whether they end up together when they're neither interesting together nor as individuals? And by extension, if the characters don't matter and their feelings mean nothing, why am I watching this? For the mediocre story? The basic ass, follow your heart and you'll get what you want moral? The forgettably average musical numbers in one so bad it got a Razzie? The only Razzie ever bestowed to an animated film? Gilbert Gottfried? Actually, that last one could be a good reason to sit through the movie, but no, it's got nothing. The crew stripped Thumbelina of any semblance of a potential hook or flair to appeal to more mainstream audiences, and guess what? It didn't work. Naturally. They made a boring movie that didn't stick out, so no one went to see it. It's not offensively bad or outstandingly exceptional. It's the one thing I never expected to call a Don Blue film. Uninteresting. I like to close my eyes so my heart can plainly see. Before we get started on this one, I want to apologize for the poor video quality. It's the only Don Blue film to have never gotten a Blu-ray release or HD upscale, so the quality is less than ideal. Take that as you will. For context, this was worked on at the same time as Thumbelina and was originally meant to release first, but the distributor didn't have nearly as much faith in it, so they released it later in the same year. Approximately, Troll in Central Park was created on a budget of $23 million, so slightly less than the studio's previous film, but undoubtedly a large gamble on their end. And you wouldn't believe me if I told you, but Troll set a big new record for Sullivan Bloof Entertainment, grossing $71,000. No, not million. Thousand. One third of a percent of the budget. It was given no advertising, an extremely, extremely limited release in theaters, a VHS release that sold like hotcakes, if you replace the word cakes with shit, and aside from being universally declared Bloof's absolute worst film by fans and critics alike, it's also considered one of the worst animated films ever created. And I know a few of you little fuckers in the comments are gonna be like, how could that be? You gotta be over-exaggerating. After all, this is Don Bloof, the man, the myth, the legend. He might not always have the right idea, and like you said, every once in a while he comes out with a failed project, but one of the worst animated films ever? Come on! Hey, if you don't wanna believe what I'm about to say, you can always hear it straight from the man himself. To quote 
Bloob directly seven years after Troll's release, the development of a story is like the development of a child in the womb. It takes time and it must be done right, and building a troll in Central Park taught us this lesson the hard way. He basically called it a stillborn baby, and is there any merit to that assertion? <laughs> 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 so how would I describe the experience of watching an animated classic such as a troll in Central Park? You ever stare intently at a rainbow until you go blind? You ever open up a five-year-old girl's Lisa Frank coloring book, barf rainbows onto it and wonder, what if this was tackier? Okay, take that and multiply it by six. It is a piece of media so sickly sweet, so unbearably cutesy, so full of happiness and hugs and the laughter of babies that I, no joke, no hyperbole, got nauseous watching it. I had to take breaks and watch the film in increments to get through it all. I'm dead fucking serious. During the drafting of this very script, I went to see Terrifier 2 in theaters, a slasher horror film supposedly so graphic, it caused faintings, vomiting, and a trip to the emergency room. I went into that, sat through it, and came back out without so much as a cramp, but a troll in Central Park got my stomach churning 25 minutes in. It's a product, an audio-visual presentation, that makes me hate happiness. The very thought of it makes me want to eat a newborn puppy in front of a toddler to simultaneously destroy life and ruin innocence at the same time. I haven't so much as said the main character's name or the premise yet, but I can feel the urge rising in me to crash my car into an orphanage and set it on fire. The film follows Stanley, a happy troll in a land of bad trolls that loves to make living flowers bloom and gardens to grow using his magical green thumb. But the mean queen of the trolls, Ganorga, doesn't like this. And so to make an example of Stanley, she sends him to a place no green grows, New York City. But what's this? Stanley ends up in Central Park, where he meets two very special, very annoying kids named Gus and Rosie. So he has a great time and Ganorga goes after him. Or I believe that's what the outline of the plot is, it's honestly difficult to quantify when so much of the runtime is spent doing entirely inconsequential shit. First, there's an extended scene of Stanley going around NYC, then after he meets the kids, there's a good heap of time donated to showing Stanley and Gus's dreams, and aside from that, almost nothing happens until 45 minutes in when Ganorga finally gets off her ass and goes to Central Park to deal with Stanley, and somehow, they draw that interaction out for 20 fucking minutes. Is there a conflict? Eh, is there a message? Yes, surprisingly. Though it isn't brought up or conveyed at all before 54 minutes in, the lesson a troll in Central Park wants to tell its audience is that your dreams will never come true if you don't have the courage to fight for what you believe in. And while admittedly on its own that's a nice message, in context it comes straight out of nowhere, and for anyone that watched Troll without sarcasm, there's no way they'd be cognitively functional enough to understand it. But maybe that's for the best. I know that when I crossed the battlefield that is this film's 65 minute length, I pleaded with my cerebellum to finally give out and remove my ability to reason. Characters? As bland as can be. Forget one-dimensional. These guys might as well be non-existent. Remember how I called the Duke of Owls an on-the-nose villain? Gnorga is so on-the-nose in the least entertaining way possible, she's gone up the fucking nose. All she ever talks about is how she's mean and grumpy and hates flowers and laughter and wants to turn all she sees to stone using her black thumb. No subtlety, nuance, charm, originality, humor, or wit, but I wanted her to do it all anyway. That moment where Rosie falls down a cliff and is presumed dead? I thought about ending the film there, so at the least it'd have a happy ending. That's how little of a shit I gave. And don't get me started on the music. Parents, is Christian Radio and Disney XM too hardcore for your kid? Then have I got the soundtrack for you. Forget Twiddly D, they're running out of batteries. Now we've got, we could fill everywhere with flowers if we each used all of our power. If we all cared is what I really mean. We could live in a world that's bright and shiny and absolutely green. Someone was paid money to write these lyrics, and it's like that for three songs. One about Ganorga and how she's the queen of mean, another where Stanley wishes the world was pretty and people never fought, and a third, also performed by Stanley, about how he hopes dreams can come true. I won't bombard you with any more lyrics for the sake of your health, both physically and mentally, but you get the picture. I'm so fucking done talking about this piece of shit. Some media is fun to rant about, but this hurts. Trust me, I could keep going if I wanted to, but... Uh, I don't. If there is a film worse than this out there in the universe, let alone Blue's filmography, my life might end before this video does. So far down at the bottom of the list, no one will ever have to see it again. Ever. It's only up from here. Now and forever, I'll show her. You know, it's kind of funny. Seeing as I just watched the last project of Blue's supposed Dark Age, I can 100% say for sure that Troll in Central Park is the worst thing he's been a part of. But he still put his name on that. He looked at the finished product that was Troll and thought, yes, 
I am the director and would like that associated with my brand, but he didn't do the same for Pebble and the Penguin, explicitly asking for him and his partner Gary Goldman to not be credited as directors. So why is that? Production issues. Lots and lots of production issues. More specifically, later into the film's creation process, the distributors of Pebble, MGM, wanted one or two small changes, pretty basic by the book stuff, nothing too major, other than cutting a couple scenes, trimming a sequence or two, removing whole characters, and re-recording the voices of others that had already been animated. And due to all those drastic changes near what was supposed to be the end of production for Pebble, multiple of the redone scenes ended up behind schedule and had to be outsourced to an unknown Hungarian studio for completion. And because the crew was so busy appealing to studio demands, they had almost no time to review or reconsider what they'd written. It didn't make a difference if they saw problems that needed redoing, and they did, as Bloof would admit years later. They had to finish by a deadline imposed by MGM after all those ridiculous requests, so there was no time to fix what needed fixing. The film had become such a train wreck and so far from Bloof and Goldman's vision that they demanded to have their names removed, and before the film could so much as finish, they abandoned ship and said bon voyage to the sinking vessel they'd originally built. To which I say, out respect. Troll in Central Park might have been an absolute abomination, but it was Bloof's abomination. He had full creative control, made a ton of mistakes along the way, and fessed up to those mistakes by admitting the product was his. He never tried to hide his name from the mediocre or below average works he produced, since whether or not they succeeded, whether or not they were beloved, he owed up to them as being his creative vision, no matter how misguided they may have been. I'll review Pebble and the Penguin as part of his filmography as he did work on it, and to this day it's referred to in conversation as a Don Blue film, and it technically is considering the company's name after him, but keep in mind, it isn't his fault or vision. Basing the premise on how a certain breed of penguin proposes to its lifelong mate using a stone, we have the displeasure of focusing on Hubie, an annoying, whiny, fake philosophical outcast with an inconsistent stutter that wants to propose to a girl, Marina, but can't find the courage to, or I guess you could say, he doesn't have the stones. Not to mention he's got fierce competition from another macho penguin, Drake, who Jesus Christ on a bike! I thought Goldie was gonna be the most sexualized bird in a Dom Blue production, but goddamn, those are the biggest titties I've ever seen, and fully uncensored no less blue view, horny devil you. Where was I? Sorry, I was hypnotized by male penguin knockers. Drake also wants to propose to Marina, so to take Hubie out of the picture, he sends him floating away on an iceberg, only to be caught by a ship where he meets Rocco, a rebellious rock hopper rapaciously ranting about wanting freedom. Shut up. So with the help of Hubie, they escape and go on an adventure to get back to Marina so Hubie can offer her the perfect stone that came falling from the sky before Drake seduces her using his Tim Curry singing voice. Don't be a card, babe. Don't mess with Drake. <laughs> Suggest you would do best to beg. As you just heard, the music isn't exactly on the same level of genuine goodness as American Tale, and if that clip got you hoping for ironic enjoyment like Rockadoodle, don't get your hopes up. The one I played, Don't Make Me Laugh, is a diamond in the rough among a sea of uninspired novelty songs, and akin to Rockadoodle, the explanation for why it's so enjoyable lies in the delivery. I've said it once and I'll say it a million times Tim Curry always makes the films he's in better, because he gives 110%, even during the moments he has no logical reason to. Lyrically and musically speaking, it sucks. The beat is prodding and uninterested, his rhyme scheme is yawn-worthy, but Curry pumps it full of his patented camp. And mixed with him intermittently going in and out of his surfer do-bro voice back to his fruity British accent, such an inadvertently amazing performance set to such a mediocre composition leads to an ironic masterpiece. For the other songs, though, you're better off skipping them entirely. For example, Hubie, befitting of his personality, has an annoying little number stating all the things he wonders about. Like, what do colors mean? Why is the moon new? Why is the ocean green? Why do brothers push pounds and powder? Why did Bush knock down the tower? Sorry, I, <laughs> I couldn't resist, but you get the picture. There's no meat to the bones of these snooze fests, and I wouldn't expect any less from the same composer that did Thumbelina. Though in all fairness, he can't be blamed for the sequences accompanying the music looking super inconsistent. I totally understand why Bloove, as an animator himself, couldn't in good conscience put his stamp of approval on Pebble. I haven't mentioned the animation of Bloove's projects too much unless exceptionally well done or unlike his normal work, but one word I'd never used to characterize his stuff is unprofessional. His entire brand was based on keeping old traditions of animation alive and never cutting costs if possible. That's how I know he wasn't a fan of the scenes worked on by the cheap Hungarian studio they outsourced so the film would finish on time. And it's not a smooth transition at all. These moments are sprinkled throughout the film, but the most obvious drop in quality between cuts has to be for the song The Good Ship Misery. It's a pointless, forgettable number that completely halts the plot to happen, but that's your average Tuesday for Pebble. However, when the quality drops, it fucking tanks. You've got 3D models turning into badly imitated 2D ones because the Hungarian studio
studio doesn't have the technology nor models. The characters' hands and feet clip in and out of the cage they're supposed to be in or jitter around when they're supposed to be still. On occasion, several of the characters will straight up stop moving and turn into still JPEGs while the music keeps going. And most noticeably of all, the colors and line quality are on par with the 90s cartoon tie-in this film never had. But the funniest part of it all? I'm showing you an improved version for the Blu-ray release that Bluven Goldman worked on to correct some of the worst errors, including times where the characters would not be fully drawn in the frame and fade into nothingness at the bottom. That's how rushed this was. I feel so sorry for Don and Gary that they and the animators would have to give up their integrity like this for the sake of executives that have no clue how animation works but want it out as soon as possible. The making of a big budget theatrical film is a compromise between artistic vision and marketability, but clearly the creative side was stretched too thin, and for artists there's no worse feeling. And that same kind of rushing can be observed in the story, which has so many pacing issues it's unreal. Outside of Hubie and Marina's romance mirroring the same brevity problems Cornelius and Thumbelina's had, the whole story is supposedly a race to the finish before mating season comes and Marina has to choose a lover or be exiled from the rookery, cause that's what you call a group of penguins. But we never know how close it gets as Hubie tries to make it back home. A couple miscellaneous times are thrown around, Hubie was out for three days before waking up, Rocco says it'll take four days to get there, and Drake keeps telling Marina the date's approaching, but we don't know how close that is to mating season. There's no point of reference. If we had a countdown on screen, a general time frame, whatever, we'd feel the tension better and get more into Hubie's headspace. But he and Rocco spend so much time dicking around while we're watching them, there might as well not be a time limit at all. It's not like they gave a shit. Side note, Rocco was the one saving grace of the movie. I love his design and way of constantly telling Hubie to shut the fuck up. I didn't have anything else to say about the film, so I thought I'd slip that in before moving on. The release of Pebble and the Penguin marked a significant end to an era in Bloof and his associates' careers. Whether or not the film was a success, they knew they didn't want to keep working under the kind of strict rules and ludicrous demands MGM had, nor did they want to deal with the fallout and inevitable closing of Sullivan Bloof, then Don Bloof Ireland Limited, if the film failed. So, as I mentioned, they jumped ship, and when Pebble bombed, losing out to a goofy movie released five days before, after 16 years in production, the studio Blue started all that time ago with just over a dozen Disney defectors closed its doors on Halloween of 1995. But that isn't the end of Blue's story. After all, what's the point in jumping ship if you don't have an emergency raft to keep you alive? For Blue and Goldman, that raft was an offer from 20th Century Fox to head a new animation studio they were starting up, which would go on to be titled... Fox Animation Studios. The company, up till acquiring Bluff and Goldman, was mainly a distributor for animation instead of a creator, though they had also tried to work with outside studios on projects beforehand, but none were major successes, so they decided to build one from the ground up with the duo in hopes they'd create films to rival Disney like they did back in the 80s. But to stand a chance at rivaling the big boys, you've got to make just as big of a first impression. So the crew shopped around for ideas to adapt a pre-existing film from Fox's catalog and took particular interest in a lesser-known 50s drama based on a play that was based on the real-life events of the Russian royal family, the Romanovs. In real life, they were the leading monarchs of all of Russia until 1917, when, with the rise of Vladimir Lenin and Karl Marx's ideas of communism, the masses, under the banner of Lenin's political ideology, the Bolsheviks, revolted against the family, citing food shortages and high unemployment as reasons for their rebellion. There's far more to it than that, in all honesty, such as the royal family straight up being poor rulers that didn't handle conflict well, but that's not what we're here to talk about, so all you need to know is that after successfully abdicating the current czar as ruler of the country and establishing a new system of government, the royal family was killed by firing squad, including their child five heirs, in July of 1918. The now ruling government of Russia, however, didn't want a political scandal on their hands that blamed Lenin for the family's deaths. So they covered it up and were intentionally vague about whether or not the royals were truly alive or dead, sparking rumors that the youngest princess of the family, Anastasia, had made it out alive. We now know that this is false as, during an investigation in 2007, she and her younger brother's remains were found in a small grave close by that of the one used for the main family. But that was a long wait before we got definitive proof of anything, so several imposters posing as Anastasia tried to claim they were her. Of them, the most famous was a woman going under the alias Anna Anderson, who many believed was indeed the princess, and with just how convoluted the story was, eventually people thought of the idea to write a hypothetical story in which Anna was Anastasia instead of a Polish factory worker slash mental patient, cause come on, that's not nearly as interesting. Plus it's way less grisly than ending the story with, yeah, that little girl did get shot to death by a firing squad with her entire family after a year in prison, and to me it 
makes total sense why Bluv would choose to do Anastasia over something more recognizable like the King and I. The story is naturally dark and has room for comedic or melancholic exaggeration right up Bluv's alley, but it's also the story of a princess, so it fits the mold set by Disney while having the unique trait of being based on real events rather than a fairy tale. And in the end, his hunch turned out to be right, Anastasia becoming his most popular film to date with many people to this day confusing it with Disney, but I know for a fact that they'd never have the balls to produce a feature like it due to the historical relation alone. Anastasia as an animated movie was only something Bluv could make at that time, and the way he subverts common tropes of his competitors while also reveling in others and learning from his previous mistakes is nothing short of masterful. Firstly, for once in a long time in Bluv's history, music is a major positive for Anastasia instead of a detriment. They got actual, experienced, award-winning lyricists and musicians behind Broadway shows to create the music, and it makes so much of a difference. It's not surprising at all that they didn't cut all but one song from the Broadway adaptation. No longer do we have to listen to Barry Manilow try and fail to write pointless, impersonal love ballads and non-sequitur songs that have nothing to do with the film it belongs to. Now we've got narratively relevant and progressing, catchy, cinematic, well-produced songs that all feel like they should be there. Plot-wise, the film takes an alternate history approach to the story of Anastasia, having her escape the Bolsheviks but lose her memory as a child and grow up not knowing who she is. However, everything changes when she meets Dimitri and Vlad, two con men attempting to fool Anastasia's grandmother into believing they found her long-lost relative for a big cash reward. And the amnesiatic Anastasia, renamed Anya, goes on a journey with them, finding out her past along the way as she's pursued by an undead version of Rasputin, who put a curse on the Romanov family to kill all of them and has remained in limbo with Anya still alive. I'm mentioning this as a preamble to discussing the songs of Anastasia because, like I said, they're all relevant to and do well at progressing the story. A rumor in St. Petersburg is a classic big band opener establishing the status of the Romanov family and the duo's plan to get rich quick. Journey to the Past does a great job building Anya's character from the moment we see her, rising in tempo and sound as she gets more confident in herself about finding where she came from. Learn to do it too helps bring the main leads of the film together and shows off their phenomenal chemistry. Paris holds the key makes for one of those great 11th hour musical numbers that builds up Dimitri's conflicted feelings about learning who Anya truly is and that he'll never get to see her after tonight. In the Dark of the Night is one of my all-time favorite villain songs. It fills Rasputin with so much personality, does an amazing job building up his power and menacing figure, and most importantly of all, it's just a straight-up banger. Soon she will feel that her nightmares are real. In the dark of the night! She'll be through! But all of them pale in comparison to the real showstopper of Anastasia, once upon a December. The moment leading up to the number is that Anya is looking for Dimitri to help her get to Paris and ends up in the now dilapidated ballroom we once saw full of people and color at the start of the film. For us as audience members, we know what the change in scenery represents and how Anya would feel if she could fully remember her past, but she doesn't. So her song reflects remembering a vague recollection. She's frustrated by the memory right on the tip of her tongue that she can't reach, but more than frustration, she feels confused and longing, wondering about what makes this place so familiar to her. She dances with the uncle clear memories of her now-dead family, unable to feel true despair since she doesn't know how or if they died or how important they once were to her. Yet she dances anyway in the hopes it could trigger the feeling she had when it meant something to her. There's so much overt and underlying symbolism in the number, and Liz Calloway's singing adds on to it to create a beautiful, intense, multi-layered scene that so perfectly encapsulates what Anya is feeling while leaving a certain vagueness to match the holes in her memory. Gotta be my number one song musically and visually from a blue production. It adds so much character in a way Disney has never quite attempted on an emotional level before, and that's part of why it pisses me off so much when it's thought of as a Disney film. I know on a technical level, after the 20th Century Fox buyout, it by extension became a Disney film of sorts, but you know what I'm getting at. And my praise for the film doesn't stop there. Actually, I, I just realized, the song choices fit so well with the film, I kinda summarized everything else I had to say in the music section. Rasputin's a cool, menacing villain, and additionally, his whole thing of falling apart at the seams was an interesting touch. Anya's friendship with the duo and eventual romance with Dimitri was super well-paced, and he was a better love interest than any Blue Vinco had written before by being his own character that was flawed, but selfless during the times he needed to be. The story has underlying complex emotional theming that's hard to come by in other films of the same nature. All around, it was a superb movie, and it proves that Bluv is able to take criticism to heart and make improvements to evolve his art. All you need to do is look at Thumbelina as a reference point between the two and see all that was done to create a more coherent original product that took inspiration from Disney, but not them alone, so it has a completely different flavor worthy of note on its own. I know for some the historical inaccuracy is too much to get over, but I can very easily separate fiction from reality, seeing as I'm not a baby nor a redditor, and so Anastasia is going above Secret of Nim in the ranking. From what I've heard, there's one more musical after this to look forward to, so I'm excited to see what else Don, Gary, and the songwriters have in mind. I'll bet you've got a possible hero in you.
It's no secret that companies like money. It's part of why Blue have left Disney in the first place, and it's why, often without their consent, animation studios tend to outsource the continuations of their successful projects to less expensive studios to make cheap, direct-to-DVD, or occasionally theatrical sequels without any input from the original creators to speak of. As I outlined in my Disney sequels video, that isn't an immediate death knell for the film's quality, but more often than not, it leads to a lesser product that wasn't trying its hardest, and Blue's no stranger to direct-to-DVD sequels without his input. Other than the obvious bombs to stay away from, most of his films have gotten the sequel treatment and beyond. Of course, Land Before Time has 13 sequels plus a TV show, but it goes way further than that. All Dogs Go to Heaven got a sequel with Charlie Sheen plus a TV show plus a weirdly good Christmas special. American Tale got three films plus a show. Secret of Nim got a sequel with Ralph Macchio and Eric Idle that's... Gotta be the weirdest one by far, yet weirder than the American Tales sequel where Fievel becomes a cowboy. But there is one spin-off film related to Blue's work that had his personal involvement as a director, and that's the kind of sorta, I guess, sequel slash spin-off to Anastasia, Bartok the Magnificent. I would tell you more about the production or how it came to be, but there doesn't appear to be anything to find. From the descriptions of different pages selling the DVD, it doesn't look like there are any extras, and neither Blue nor Goldman did any press before release, at least that I can find. The most entertaining bit of media I could find for the film outside of the movie itself was this potentially kind of racist ad for the video release that takes pot shots at Pokemon of all brands for some reason and concludes by saying it's made in America as one of the incentives for buying it like I I don't I'm not sure what that has to do with the quality of the film, but okay, th this is now going to be the first thing that comes to mind if someone mentions Bartok the Magnificent, and saying the title aloud, I'm now picking up on the fact I didn't mention Bartok at all when I was discussing Anastasia. But I don't think you could blame me too harshly for that, considering he isn't all that present in the film. Basically, Bartok was Rasputin's cowardly albino bat sidekick. He's played by Hank Azaria putting on a mix of his Dr. Fink and Milhouse's dad voices from The Simpsons, and as far as semi-main comic relief characters go, he does his job fine making occasional one-liners and remarks to lighten the mood when it wouldn't be too inappropriate, he served his role perfectly fine. And so, for a spin-off slash sequel slash whatever movie, I suppose a completely unrelated story to that of Anastasia would be the best option. And I mean, there is no relation other than the setting and presence of Bartok, plus a story sort of focusing on Russian royalty. The film follows Bartok at some point in time before or after Anastasia, it could be either Bats live for like 30 years or so on average, as a street performer claiming to have done all kinds of heroic deeds and what not when the Prince of Moscow, Ivan, is supposedly kidnapped by the witch Baba Yaga, and Bartok is called to save him, so he and his theatrical bear friend Zozi go on a quest to do just that. To save time and not draw out a glaring twist though, I'll go ahead and tell you that it wasn't Baba Yaga at all, but this darkly clad evil advisor woman, and I don't necessarily believe it's a twist to begin with, it's so goddamn evident, but that doesn't take away from what it's trying to be. By no means is Bartok the magnificent and amazing piece of cinema, but I don't know, as far as direct-to-DVD sequels go, it's definitely up there. Blue's never had had a film solely based in comedy, at least up to this point. Maybe Titan AE, the dark sci-fi, is a total laugh riot, I don't know. But intentionally speaking, Bluv hasn't made comedy the focal point of his films at any point. And after Bartok, I sort of wonder why he never did, because Bartok's funnier than a lot of animated comedies I've seen in theaters. It doesn't take itself too seriously at all, and that's the best approach for one of these inconsequential side stories. You don't gotta go for a big scope to make an enjoyable film, and Bartok, as a self-aware comedy, is able to hit that balance between two extremes and chooses to be absurdly large in setting, but not nearly as dramatic. It takes advantage of its large for a direct-to-DVD film budget to incorporate a variety of settings with varying color palettes and moods, so plenty of diversity in visuals. Enough to keep you paying attention, that's for sure. And beyond offering new, inventive ways for the characters to bounce off each other and make jokes, the tasks Bartok completes also develop him as a protagonist and, though comedically, allow him an arc over the course of the film, something I wasn't expecting. He's not a super fascinating, multi-layered character or whatever, but I wasn't going into Bartok the Magnificent looking for that, and if you were fucking uh, touch some grass, man. I review cartoons for a living, and even I can tell you that. Bartok's also a musical, same as Anastasia, and though the soundtrack isn't fantastic per se, like the rest of the movie, it's charming, fun, and shows that the crew was willing to go the extra mile for it in ways other direct-to-video films wouldn't bother with. Just as surprisingly as Blue and Goldman returning to direct, the songwriters and musicians for Anastasia were brought back to shovel an extra big heaping of flavor on Bartok, and I can feel that in the Broadway inspiration for the film's five songs, which never stop the plot but keep it moving forward, and they aren't so tightly packed together 
together, they become overbearing despite the short runtime. Sorry if me talking about musical numbers by describing them in a listicle type format is getting annoying. I can't think of a better way to convey it. The sort of main song of the film, A Possible Hero, delivers an early glimpse of the character development Bartok is going to get with the help of Zozi, and I love that Bartok sings the line as Impossible Hero. That's funny characterization, and the other important songs for the film do an equally good job at displaying the personalities of their respective singers. Baba Yaga's song is jazzy and sly, complimenting her humorous, sarcastic attitude, and the advisor song is loaded with double entendres and narcissism. It's all way too professional for direct-to-video, and Fox executives thought so too, asking Blue if they could attempt a wide release, but apparently he and Goldman didn't believe it could work, as Bartok was developed for home video, so the film's flaws would stick out. But come on, this has got to be one of Blue's most musically competent films, and the animation could still have passed for theatrical quality if it was made clear what Bartok was going for. You're telling me Doug's first movie and The King and I, two shitty films made on smaller budgets than Bartok that released the exact same year, deserved to be on the big screen but Bartok didn't? Nah. This deserved to be seen by people and remembered, even if it was only a moderate success or barely made a profit. Better than being forgotten entirely like it has been, to the point I could find a high quality rip on YouTube. It's my time to find proving ground tonight. And thus we've come to the final film of our long journey through the world of Don Bluth, his sci-fi epic space opera, Titan After Effects. No, in actuality it stands for After Earth. Kind of ironic, seeing as it was released right before Bluth and Fox Animation Studio dropped off the edge of the Earth. Wait, is that irony or coincidence? But regardless, it's most likely the last piece of feature-length media we're ever going to get from Bluth. So, how does it compare to the rest of his filmography? Well, as you should know by this point, sci-fi isn't exactly a genre Bluth and Goldman are all too versed or conscious of, but they gave the film a try anyway. Not that they have much of a choice, the studio that they were brought on to run already being on the chopping block if they didn't. And for the writing crew they had... a lot of people. Seeing as the film had been floating around in development hell for a while, but the main writer you'll recognize behind Titan is none other than... Joss Sweden? Okay, I know there's a lot of hatred for Joss Whedon now, both in light of recent allegations of workplace harassment and his style of humor influencing the later stages of the MCU in a negative way, but I'm having a confused reaction to this for completely separate reasons. By this point, he hadn't been associated with Avengers or Serenity or Cabin in the Woods. He was the guy that wrote Alien Resurrection. I, I know that film wasn't technically all his fault, but that's what his name was associated with, so it's weird to think that out of all the people for Fox to invest over $100 million in, including the $30 million they'd spent on the film before, before giving it to Blue and Goldman, they'd put their faith in Joss plus a bunch of unknown writers. One person they didn't put faith into to write the story, though, funnily enough, was Don Blue. And that makes too much sense. Titan is a film often devoid of creativity from a writing perspective, both in characters and especially its story. Something so full of plot holes and contrivances, it doesn't resemble Blue at all. Thematically speaking, the best way I can describe Titan A's main idea is one dealing with the ever-evolving nature of people, but even that's stretching. The film focuses on a ragtag team of explorers in search of a vessel called Titan that supposedly has an incredibly powerful function, but it can only be accessed by the inventor's son, a junk scrapper by the name of Kale, who was given the key as well as a map to the vessel before leaving Earth to be destroyed. So now, as one of the last remaining humans in the universe, he, a ship captain that knew his dad Corso, a girl trying to keep the memory of Earth alive Akima, and a couple alien crewmates need to find Titan before a group known as the Dredge Can, who want to destroy Titan like they did to the Earth out of a fear concerning what humanity could do with it. And that's the first problem I have with the story. Across the film, we see how desperately the Dredge are looking for Kale so they can get the map and destroy Titan, but you want to guess what Titan does? It's a machine that creates planets. It has all the data of Earth to make a complete replica with animals and everything, and I gotta wonder, why are the Dredge afraid of how this could change humanity? Because that's the vague reason given for why they blew up Earth in the first place. They feared what Titan's inception could transform humanity into, but there's no elaboration beyond that. How would it make them different for the worse? Would it specifically affect the Dredge in a negative way? I couldn't tell you. The Dredge are never given much of a description about where they came from or what their ultimate goal is beyond them being made of energy and they fear humanity for their technological advances, but they never answer why they're scared, so we don't have a clue what the meaning behind their motivations are, if they have justifications for their motivations at all. And without that added background, the Dredge are far more two-dimensional. Also, doesn't the function of Titan seem like a self-fulfilling prophecy? It's almost as though the writers came up with the idea of what Titan did first, then they wrote a story around it to give the thing a use, but they never mentioned what it was intended for in the first place, so the timeline is, humanity creates a way to clone the planet, we never know why they created this in the first place, the dredge are scared of it for some unexplained reason, let's just chalk it up to human intelligence for now, they destroy the planet, and the machine the dredge destroyed Earth in search of is able to bring the planet back. 
What? If they were preparing for an attack from the dredge, that would be one thing, but no, it's explicitly stated that the dredge destroy Earth because of Titan. So that creates another question. Why would humanity create a machine that could replicate their planet, assuming there was no major threat to them beforehand? In fact, it was the creation of Titan that led to them needing to use it, so why create it at all? Did Kale's dad have a god complex that made him hate everyone on Earth and want to reset it like Noah's Flood? I can't comprehend this. There are too many questions left unanswered. Say what you will about any of Blue's stories, I know I have, but none of them are so full of plot holes it's hard to watch the film otherwise. I suppose the reason for the story's lack of sense is to put greater focus on the cast of characters, but there isn't much to them you couldn't find in much better media that came out after it. Titan's cast reminded me heavily of the same group scenarios used to build the teams of Atlantis Lost Empire and Treasure Planet, two films that came out after Titan was released but implemented their crews way better. So what sets them apart? On a basic level it appears you could draw comparisons between multiple characters from TP and Atlantis that fit the same archetypes in Titan. The hothead, the weird scientist, the fatherly figure, the main character never had that's also conniving. So it's not from a lack of building blocks. Instead, what it all comes down to is how the films use their time. Titan fills up so much of its runtime with space battles and chases and fights, so a majority of the time, almost the entire cast outside of Kale and Akima are left to the wayside. We never get moments of downtime where the crew all hangs out together, displays their relationships, interests, goals, have a heart-to-heart -heart about their feelings. I know it sounds corny and gay and shit, but Treasure Planet and Atlantis both knew they had large casts of characters that they wanted the audience to care for. And so they created scenarios where we could watch them interact in a natural setting and bond. Titan never quite has a moment like that. We see Kale individually meet the crew members one by one in a brief exchange. One or two additional crew members might tag along during a chase scene, but they'll usually be split up so they don't have much back and forth. The closest we come to having a fully realized character is Preed, a posh, sly know-it-all that double-crosses Corso after he predictably double-crosses Akima and Kale, making for a situation that's convoluted, sure, but funny at least in its absurdity. For the rest of the side cast, though, I barely remember their names. Let me see, we got Nerdy Turtle, Angry Leg Woman, Obvious Double Crossing Father Figure Captain, I know I said his name like five seconds ago, but he's such a forgettable antagonist I forgot again. And though I might remember Akima and Kale's names, that doesn't make them good either. Kale is passable as a typical, sarcastic, young adult dystopian novel protagonist, getting a couple good digs in along the way, but Akima's... She's there, I suppose. I mentioned the whole wanting to preserve Earth thing to give her a bit more of a descriptor, but beyond that, she's about as basic a girl character as you can get. You know the one. They exist in fiction to fall in love with the main character, despite the fact they have no romantic chemistry. I'm not sure she had one plot-relevant scene in the entire film. She simply existed for the sake of it. And that's what I'd label Titan AE as a project if it weren't for the animation. I'm not sure if I'd call Titan Blue's most competently directed film animation-wise, but it's exceptional. A recurring theme I noticed in all his works leading up to this was a reluctance to use CG of any kind in his films other than for minor bits, and Blue was doing animated features at a time where that was the smarter option. But after the move to Fox, either Blue or the company pushed him to experiment more with the new medium, as you can see in parts of Anastasia. Occasionally it works, more often it doesn't, but it was a step towards Blue getting comfortable using 2D mixed with 3D animation, and for Titan, he went all out, using the molded environments to better track the characters and create several panoramic shots that never get tiring to look at. I won't say it aged as well 100%, Titan was made on an incredibly short time time frame of less than two years, so parts of the CG had to be outsourced to other studios, including a budding version of what we'd come to know as Blue Sky, but for the time it was released, Titan pulled off a level of CG integration in a 2D film rarely seen before. Disney experimented during their renaissance using occasional computer-assisted shots, but they didn't go all out with it until after Titan came out. And I don't want to say for sure it was the inspiration for the visual style of films like TP and Atlantis, but the times line up, so I wouldn't be shocked. They were really ambitious if nothing else, and for how relatively early the technology still was for future films, Titan remains surprisingly not so dated thanks to stylization and breathtaking every once in a while, though the 2D is far more consistently impressive. I can't remember a time where Blue's art was as smooth as it is in Titan, and though the story may be nonsensical and the characters unoriginal, I'd still be willing to check out the film again for visual purposes alone. It's got so many interesting uses. Too bad there wasn't an equally interesting script to follow it. Titan is not Blue's worst film, not by a long shot. He has made far less appealing, gag-inducing pictures before, but what puts me off above all I've talked about so far is that it doesn't capture the feeling of a Don Bluth movie. It lacks his style, tone, spontaneity, creativity. Bluth's an artist that's made many a mistake, but it's his ability to bounce back from those mistakes and attempt to improve on them while sprinkling in new ideas that makes him so appealing to watch. You never get quite the same experience twice from Bluth. And when I discussed bad Bluth films outside of Thumbelina, his black sheep he had to rewrite the whole script of in two weeks, his bad films have always been uniquely bad in a way only Bluth could do. Whereas Titan's flaws are baked into 
its premise in a way that several sci-fi before have done. Underexplained lore, too high an emphasis on fighting, not enough personality, I've seen this play out before, it's nothing new. No wonder Bluth doesn't look back on the project fondly, he was forced to do it and had no familiarity with the subject. He wasn't given the same liberties he had for other projects, and though it's sad to see how the film drained his energy, it helps fill up my scale for how much creative freedom Bluth needs to create a quality product. Giving him too much freedom led to All Dogs Go to Heaven and Rockadoodle, and while both of them have a mix of ironic and genuine praise I can levy at them, it's no secret how disorganized they were. To an extent, neither were fully finished, so they suffered from Bluth's indecisiveness in the face of so many ideas. Then there were times Bluth had too much restriction. In these scenarios, he had little to no control and couldn't let his creative wings fly, so we were stuck with subpar, mediocre old Thumbelina and Titan AE. They played it too safe, so neither were enticing enough to go see in theaters. Finally, there were the times Bluth was given the right amount of restriction under equally creative people that encouraged his good choices, leading to Secret of Nim, American Tale, and Land Before Time, three of his best, most successful films. What I'm getting at here is that Bluth is a naturally inventive visionary, and he needs people willing to say no so he can discern the best ideas from the worst. But if you keep him out of the loop too much or rely on him acting like someone else, it leads to the worst results. A 4 or 5 out of 10. Not significant enough to mention in conversation, not terrible enough to rant about. That was the worst bit about Titan, it generated no buzz. According to Bluth, there also wasn't any promotion either, so Titan's massive failure doesn't shock me in the slightest, and in a way, Bluth seemed to have the same relief of the film failing as he did for Pebble and the Penguin. It was an experience that disillusioned him with the process of Hollywood filmmaking, and so, to keep his creativity soaring, he decided to leave high-budget industry filmmaking entirely to focus on smaller projects including games, music videos, and a potential live-action version of a groundbreaking animated arcade game he created back in the 80s, Dragon's Lair. I'm not sure what he has planned in the future, if at all, but whatever it may be, good or not, I'll be waiting, because there are few people I've watched more passionate about the medium of animation than Donald Virgil Bluv. And now, for our feature ranking. At the bottom of the list, we have A Troll in Central Park, Thumbelina, The Pebble and the Penguin, Banjo the Woodpile Cats, Titan AE, The Small One, All Dogs Go to Heaven, Rockadoodle, Bartok the Magnificent, The Land Before Time, The Secret of Nim, Anastasia, and at the very top of the list, An American Tale. Thanks for watching, and if you like this video, stick around. I've got a way more controversial director to rank you the next one of these. I've been just up, and I don't know who you've been. But I hope you're a fan now. Peace out.